We present to you The Muse, written by Kurt Petrie. The story is read to you by three artificial intelligence voices. We hope you enjoy. The sickly sweet scent of lilacs wafted through the cracked window, rousing Victor from his slumber. He rubbed his eyes, feeling disoriented and groggy. He stretched out on the plush mattress but found only frigid sheets by his side. He sat up, yawned, then stretched one more time. Kim was an early riser and was either out for a jog or getting an early morning yoga session in before they'd start the day. The sound of something shattering caught his attention. He rushed across the vestibule through the parlor room to the kitchen to find Kim cursing. Broken glass was scattered on the floor near the island. His high school sweetheart bent over the sink washing, her hand dripping with blood. Honey, are you okay? The damn glass slipped, she replied tersely, wrapping a paper towel around her hand. I don't have time for this. Kim began to clean the mess. Hold on, I'll do that. You take care of that cut, and I'll clean up here, Victor said, expecting some gratitude, but none came. She was out and heading to the bathroom without a word. He thought the behavior was odd, but decided to ignore it. She seemed on edge and could be having a bad morning. With the floors clean, he decided to check on her, but she wasn't in the bathroom. This time, she was in the den on her phone. Yes, I'll need you to pick him up at 10 a.m. She gave the caller details for an incoming flight. It was 8.30, and Victor could guess why Kim was tense. It had to be Mark, and he was coming in early, which, from what she'd told him, was rare. Something was up. Thanks. Try to be on time. Okay? She whispered, hanging up the phone. Victor's mind raced as she strode past him and returned to the bedroom. This place is a mess. Her voice barely above a whisper as she thought out loud. I have to call Daphne. She'll know what to do. Victor's eyes locked onto her, trying to read her thoughts. Is it Mark? He asked, his voice filled with frustration. Kim gave him a look of icy determination. Victor knew it well. The same one she'd given him all those years ago in high school any time he'd crossed her. It meant he was no longer welcome. You have to go, Vic. She told him, her voice steady and cold. He's coming home. Make sure all your stuff is gone. Get to the cottage. There can't be any trace of you here. Victor felt a chill run down his spine. What's happening? he asked. <sighs> I don't know, Kim replied, her voice trembling. But you need to leave. I'll gather your things and put them in a bag. I'll get rid of everything that ties you to this place. But you have to go now, before it's too late. It's got to be because of me. It makes sense that if he cared about you at all, he'd come in to meet me face to face. Kim had asked Mark if it were okay that he stay at the cottage. She fed Mark the story of them being old friends. That Victor was down on his luck. It made sense that he'd come in to check on things. You're probably right, she added. But the timing didn't feel right. She told Mark more than two weeks ago about their chance encounter and how he needed a place to stay. Then Kim offered the cottage. If Mark was worried, why did it take him so long to get around to scheduling a flight? No, this could be about something else. Maybe Mark was coming to tell him that he couldn't stay anymore. He changed his mind, and although he wished him all the best, he needed to stay away from his home, from his wife. The thinking part of his brain knew this was a real possibility, so it was to his surprise when his emotional side spoke. Why do you care so much? he asked. Kim stared at him with his shaving bag and toothbrush in one hand and shoes in the other. We're married, Vic. He's my husband. Are you dense? Do I need to spell it out? I need you to get all of your stuff. She shoved his things into his arms. Go home, and I'll call you when I can. And make sure you get all your clothes before you leave. God forbid he'd know you no longer loved him, Victor said. He knew he needed to shut up, just stop talking and walk away, even if she hated him for doing so. Walk away and let things cool off, but his feet wouldn't move. Her face grew stiff, her eyes cold. If he finds out, he'll divorce me, and I'll lose everything. You can divorce him, you know. Then you'd get half and we'd be free to live our lives together. That's not how that works. I'd need a cause. You're telling me he isn't sleeping around on those long trips, traveling the world, Victor said, knowing he really needed to shut his mouth. She didn't reply, but continued to move around, picking up anything that could have possibly been his. She gave him a coffee cup he'd bought her, which stung more than anything for some odd reason. This is your cup. I bought it for you. His voice quivered for the slightest moment. The instant he heard it, he stopped collected his thoughts, and made sure to not show that weakness again. He wouldn't let her gain the upper hand. I can't have this conversation again, Kim said as she picked up a pair of socks. Leave, Vic. I'll let you know when I can see you again. When she can see him, as if she was the one in charge. Like he was some boy toy to be cast to the side when she felt like it. 
Victor started gathering all his stuff in a pile and pulled out a duffel bag. No, that's Mark's. Use this. Kim handed him a trash bag. A trash bag? Really? It was over the top, but he wanted to make her feel guilty. To feel like she was the one overreacting. Victor, just leave. Kim pointed to the bedroom doors that led outside, then walked away. Why is he coming in anyway? He wasn't scheduled to come back for another week, Victor shouted. He didn't think she'd reply, but after a few seconds she said, I don't know why he's returning early. What I do know is I need you and your stuff out, and I'm tired of saying it. Her continual repeating of the fact he needed to leave boiled inside of him. Victor paced the room twice before shouting, Yes, ma'am. You're done with me, so I am summoned away. He turned, but before he reached the door, he heard her footsteps. Stop. Without thinking, he did so. Don't be like that, Vic. I'm just nervous. I don't know what's going on. It's strange, and I'm scared. Victor swallowed a half dozen words from leaving his mouth. Sentences that would make things worse but make him feel better. Words that would make him look weak. He could embrace her one last time and tell her he understood. But she was being so emotional. He hated it when she lost control of her emotions. He kept one hand on the doorknob. The trash bag of all his stuff over his shoulder. Well, I'll leave you alone to work it out. He shut the door and could barely hear her shouting. Don't leave like that. Come on. Victor told himself he'd put Kim and Mark out of his mind. The cottage where they let him stay was several hundred feet from the main house at the corner of the grounds. In any other situation, he would have said he'd found himself a nice setup. A free place to stay until he got back on his feet could go a long way. Two weeks earlier, when Kim said he could move in after speaking with Mark, he'd intended to look for a part-time job after losing his position at the prestigious Carson City Cars, where he was a mediocre salesman. Even though he told Kim he was a top salesman and was fired over a lie and a backstabbing co-worker that was jealous of his numbers, it's not like he was going to tell her that he learned she'd married the great Mark Davis. The very man that wrote the Chris Cole series took one of which had been turned into a movie that made him loads of money. Chris was the protagonist of the Victory series, and the first novel called of the people was one of the books he'd enjoyed before he knew who Mark Davis was. Eventually, he came up with the way into Kim's heart. He'd say he was a starving writer, trying to make it in a world that didn't understand him. He'd even started working on a story idea so he'd have something to show if anyone asked. Thankfully, social media pictures made it easy to find where Kim liked to hang out, so he hardly had to work at creating the chance encounter. He'd made the right choice because when he convinced Kim that he needed a place to stay, his life finally turned around. At the time, he was living out of his car when he told her he was looking for work in Sacramento, which happened to be where her and her rich husband lived. Her heart melted, and she offered for him to move into the cottage. She told him it was currently vacant and was previously used by a maintenance man to take care of the property. Kim said that if Victor offered to mow and keep the yard clean, she could convince Mark to let him stay. She always had a soft spot for him back in high school so he leaned into it, telling her everything he knew she wanted to hear. Once he moved in, it only took a few days before he was staying at the main house, where Kim insisted on cooking him meals. Free food and a place to stay were better than having to ask if you wanted fries with that. He kept feeding the starving writer narrative he sold Kim on, and somewhere along the way, he found himself hoping he could glean some insight into what it takes to write bestsellers for Mark, who'd written more than a dozen over the previous decade of his life. Who knows? It could be the start of discovering some hidden talent Victor never knew he had. He hadn't known it initially, but a quick internet search revealed Mark was married before Kim to a woman named Lacey, and it was with her that he'd written the Victory series, but Lacey was murdered while they were on vacation. Victor suspected that was why Mark traveled alone. On several occasions, Kim shared her frustration over how Mark never let her travel with him. She was free to travel on her own or with her girlfriends, but never with him when he was working on a novel. It turned out Mark had several strange rules he followed concerning his writing and traveling. Victor made a habit of writing every day like many suggested, but he couldn't concentrate enough to write. He cleaned the dishes, rearranged the living room furniture, and replaced a flickering light bulb that was bothering him. He welcomed any kind of distraction from Kim and Mark. Despite his efforts, he kept wondering what Kim was doing. He had a woman that fell in love with him, and he found he couldn't get her out of his mind. When did he start to care so much? It also didn't help that she was married. Without fully realizing it, he was pacing between his writing nook and the living room. If he looked out the far window, he could see the gate at the front of the property and know if Mark had arrived. An hour earlier, he saw the cleaning lady drive up, but he didn't see Mark's car. Each time he'd catch himself looking, he'd tell himself it would be the last time, then return to the blank page. His story was about a man on the run. 
a mystery that would make Dan Brown jealous, and it even had a beautiful woman that needed to be saved. He'd even set to plotting out a half-dozen thriller novels he was mimicking to ensure he'd end up with a winning story. Perhaps his man, Toby Briggs, could be held up in a cottage, waiting for his target to arrive. For that right moment to attack, the love interest would be trapped. All she needed was for Toby to solve the mystery and save the day. Victor poured a cup of coffee and walked to the living room. It was almost 10 a.m., and Mark would be getting picked up at the airport. Why did Kim have to kick him out like that? Victor glanced one more time through the window. The entrance door remained closed. He sat at the window looking. The solitary minutes turned to an hour. Then finally, the gate creaked open, and a black Mercedes drove up the hill, down the curving driveway, and into the four-car garage. Victor found himself sitting on his front porch, facing the house, facing Kim and now Mark. Victor could only pace, sit, and watch. His mind was distracted. He needed to put all that out and focus on the story, on being productive, to try not to think about Mark and Kim being together. After several attempts, he was finally starting to settle when he noticed the garage door open and a car driving down towards the gate. He tried to see if Kim was in the car, but couldn't. The cleaning lady's car followed. Luckily, days before, when Kim was in the shower, he logged into her phone and used her passcode to share her location with his phone. He pulled the app up and noticed Kim's phone wasn't at the house, but miles down the road. She was in the car. He watched the dot move along the road into the city. He closed his phone and returned to his story to start a new scene for his hero. Toby was not held up in a cottage, but had surveillance on a drug dealer with a love interest being held captive. Victor stepped away from his laptop to pour a fresh cup of coffee. Pulling out his phone, the display showed Kim's location. His heart sank when he saw they were at Luca's restaurant. Why would she allow them to go there? Luca's was a quaint, romantic little hole in the wall, where the owner had come up to ask if they were happy. If they weren't completely satisfied, he vowed the meal would be redone to their liking. There was no need because the food was the best he'd ever had. Kim was perfect, and he knew they needed to be together. They belonged together. It was fate. That restaurant was special. And she took Mark there. Victor was furious. Without thinking, he threw the coffee cup across the room. It shattered against a painting of ducks feeding on a pond. The coffee soaked the wall and carpet below. He felt like he was being played. Kim told him that she loved him, that she wanted to be with him. But she was with Mark now, and it aided his soul. An hour later, the dot moved to a nearby coffee shop, the shop where they met when he suggested they go on a trip sometime. She turned him down because she felt it was too risky. Even if she told Mark it was a girl's trip, he could decide to fly out wherever they were, and she wouldn't know what to say if the girls weren't there. When he suggested she take the trip alone, she felt Mark wouldn't believe it. She never traveled alone. She wouldn't go for the adage. It was a first time for everything, so they settled for a weekend at Lake Tahoe, where they would rent a cabin. Victor watched the dot. It was like she was trying to hurt him by going to all the places that would evoke emotion out of him. Why would anyone do that? At one point, the coffee turned to bourbon then to vodka. Victor was always careful not to take it too far. He often got into trouble when he drank too much and kept it in the back of his mind to stay in control of all situations. He was finding it harder to curb his emotions. Back to his yet-to-be-named story, he tried to figure out how Toby would save the girl. He'd written the character into a tight spot and hadn't devised a solution yet. He was getting into a rhythm when he noticed the Mercedes making its way up the driveway to the house. They were back, and with their return, his focus shifted. He knew he was done with writing. It was two miserable and unproductive hours before Kim finally called. He didn't speak. He didn't want to show any emotions. It would be better to let her talk first, then. He could better gauge his response. Victor, you there? I'm here. Oh, hey, Victor. Mark and I would like to invite you over tonight. I was talking to him about how you're a writer, too, and he'd love to have you over. You two could talk shop. I told him about your story and that you've been struggling. Maybe you could use some help. His voice was louder than it should have been. What? Why'd you tell him that, Kim? Of course, he'd like to talk to you. Kim said. He guessed she was trying to keep the conversation casual. Mark must have been close. Is Mark there? Is that why you're talking like this? Absolutely. No problem at all. Kim replied. So Mark was within earshot. Victor was ticked off. Maybe he had drunk too much. Why did you go to Lucas? You probably sat at our booth, right? Victor could hear the muffled shuffling of someone walking before Kim spoke again. She was making sure Mark wouldn't hear what she had to say. Kim dropped the disguise. I'm not even going to ask how you know where we went. She paused, then asked anyway. Did you follow us? No. Are you tracking me? Victor needed to think quick. 
he let his emotions get the best of him again. Look, I just feel you're not giving us a chance. The idea of you and him together infuriates me. Vic, I can't deal with your childish emotions. I'm not going to. Silence consumed the moment. Then Kim spoke again. Come on up when you're ready. He'll likely be in the study reading. Victor wanted to say he was done with everything, but he didn't want to lose her. Okay, I'll come. For you. Yes, that sounds great. We look forward to seeing you tonight. Victor breathed in and out. What were you doing with Mark all day? Just don't. Get your ass up here no later than eight. Mark's already started drinking, so I need this meeting between the two of you done by ten. He insisted on meeting you and listen. She paused. He's in a strange mood. Do you think he knows about us? I hope to hell he doesn't. Even though the distance from the cottage to the main house wasn't a long walk, Victor felt he needed the time to think through what he was getting into, so he took his time to clear his head and prepare for what could end up with a man accusing him of sleeping with his wife. It was a tightrope to walk. He was sleeping with her, but found that he did want Mark's mentorship to help him with his writing. All things aside, the man was one of the top-earning authors. If Mark learned of the affair, he'd probably divorce Kim, and although Victor would have her, they'd be penniless. At least he was aware enough to bring a bottle of wine. Even though he'd taken it from the main house a few days earlier, odds were Mark wouldn't know. It was three weeks since Mark left, and Kim said he rarely stayed home any longer than a week or two before setting off to write his next novel. He could play the maintenance man that long. When Victor knocked on the door, the sound of Kim's high-heeled shoes clicked as she drew near. The door opened, and he couldn't help but want to kiss her. She often did that to him, and since they became more than friends, this was the first time he had to hold back. Oh, hey, Victor. How have you been? Come on in, she said as if she hardly knew him, as if he hadn't known every inch of her body. At the moment, he felt good. He could make tonight work. He'd play along, for now. Kim, I'm good. Thanks for inviting me over. Here's a bottle of wine I brought. Kim looked at the bottle suspiciously, then continued, I'll go ahead and put it on ice for later. Where's Mark? Then out of nowhere and for no reason, she dropped the act. He's on the back patio, smoking a cigar and drinking rather heavily. Try not to make this a long night. When he drinks, he talks, and you never know what he will do or say. Okay, but if he's out there, why are you acting this way? Kim shook her head, her face turning serious. Look, Mark's here, so we, and by we, I mean you, need to be on your best behavior. I talked you up to Mark, and I'm trying to get you what you wanted. He's agreed to meet with you and talk about his writing. It could become a regular thing, and I know he can help you. So for now, you're just an old high school friend down on his luck. Also, you're looking for a job so you can move back into the city. Wait, why did you tell him that? You just need a place for a few weeks. A month at the most. I don't want Mark to think you're getting too comfortable here. He might get suspicious. Victor shook his head, as if he wasn't too comfortable last night or the night before in their bed. Right. Victor stopped short of rolling his eyes at the situation. Kim nodded. Well then, Mark is out on the patio. Let me show you the way. They walked through the house leading to the kitchen and back patio. The smoky and sweet aroma of tobacco and leather permeated the area. The man had it all. A beautiful house, nice things, and Kim, for now. The familiar lingering jealousy crept up, and he decided to make sure not to drink any more than he had to in order to get through the evening. Honey, Victor is here and... Kim paused, looking around. Mark wasn't there. Victor felt as though he was being watched, as if somehow Mark would be able to learn something by the way he was standing. He needed to be careful to not let the casual, unconscious familiarity with Kim seep through. Mark was a world-renowned author, and authors of that level were observant. Oh, there he is. He does that sometimes. Kim added, He's feeding the fish. Go over and I'll let you boys be. Really, Victor felt self-conscious. He wasn't sure where it was coming from, but he felt vulnerable. Then, as if Kim could hear his thoughts, her voice softened and she stepped closer, not too close. Mark said he wants to see you, to talk to you. Like I said, Vic, keep it short and you'll be fine. Kim walked back into the house. The path to Mark took him along the side of the lake through some brush. Victor made extra noise as he drew closer, but Mark was ignoring him. Mark was wearing a gray jacket zipped up the front, black slacks and slate gray crock loafers. He picked at a slice of bread as fish popped ripples in the nearby water. A bottle of Jack Daniels was mostly empty near the bench. 
He was unsure how to make first contact. The path had placed him behind Mark in his blind spot. Giving Mark a wide berth, Victor made sure he'd be seen from a distance. Mark picked up a nearly full bottle of Jameson Irish whiskey, then glanced at him, giving a nod before throwing a few pieces of food into the water. The whole interaction was unsettling. This wasn't a friendly encounter, but Mark didn't show signs of anger, so Victor cautiously edged closer. Those fish are hungry, he said as he stepped up to the rim of the lake, careful not to slip in. Mark gave an almost imperceptible nod, and after several awkward moments of silence, Victor decided to take the initiative and sit on the bench. More silence, then another piece of bread was thrown into the water. Did you know that fish are naturally opportunistic feeders? Mark said. Is that so? When it comes to food, they will often overindulge, eating as much as possible with no perceptible thoughts of greed or equality. I think I may have heard that before. Sometimes there is a pecking order. They'll kill their own and eat them if they cross into their territory. Fish are fascinating to study. Victor was frustrated over the depressingly somber nature, so he shifted things. Mark, it's an honor to meet you. I am a fan. A huge fan. I cut my teeth with of the people and have read all of your books. I'm always so surprised when I read each novel because they're all so different. It's like you're tapping into completely new facets of the human condition with each and every work. Victor had practiced that several times earlier in the day and felt he reached genuine admiration. Maybe he could make it as an actor. Thank you, Victor. I appreciate that and think you'd be correct with that assessment. Each novel does seem to have a life of its own, doesn't it? Kim told me about your situation. I know you're looking for a job, but I also know how beneficial rent-free housing can be for a work in progress. So do what you need to do, but know you don't need to be in a rush to leave. Kim says that she feels safe with you in the front cottage. I appreciate that. It is helpful. I've been able to work through several chapters while staying here just in the last week. Mark stood, then drew closer to the water. Are you working on something at the moment? Victor asked. Matter of fact, I am. Silence. Mark watched the fish attack the food before continuing. It's about a couple on vacation. Typical getaway trip to Bora Bora to help a troubled relationship, but like typical dramas, the story turns dark when the jealous boyfriend turns to murder and mayhem. I was making quick work of the story, then took a break when... Mark stopped mid-sentence as if in thought, then waved it off. In any case, I thought it'd be wise to come home and visit with Kim and meet you. Kim speaks highly of you. That's nice of her, to say. Victor knew that Mark didn't write at home. Most writers had quirks, and one of the stranger ones that he'd heard was Mark refusing to write at home. He had to be traveling to write. It was another one of the rules, and he'd never once broken that one as long as Kim had known him. How long do you think your break will be? Mark turned to face Victor for the first time. I'm not sure. It depends. Victor wanted to ask what it depended on, but Mark continued, The rain is coming soon. Let's take a walk. We can talk about your novel. I've found that the human condition, as you mentioned earlier, can inspire many things, but it's up to us to tread carefully to let the inspiration in. Let's see where this goes. The scent of the coming rain on the wind followed them as they walked to the house. Victor found that he couldn't stop talking about his story once he got going. He expressed his frustration over not knowing how to write the climax. How he kept changing the core ideas but Mark's entire demeanor shifted the moment they settled into the office. Writing can, and usually is, such a solitary task. It's easy to forget that there is a whole world out there filled with people. Real people living regular lives, and in some cases, dangerous lives. The comment came out of nowhere and threw Victor off. He paused to see if Mark would say anything else, but he didn't. Instead, Mark sat at his desk and stared at him. Victor decided to plow forward despite the moment. I'm sure you've been asked this countless times, but how do you come up with a satisfying ending? What are you going to do in your current story? You said murder, so I'm guessing this is suspense, or maybe a thriller? Victor needed to stop talking. He was acting like a fanboy. Mark nodded. It is. The boyfriend ends up killing a self-perceived romantic rival at the midpoint, but has to hide his actions. Soon, the authorities zero in on him. Just as he thinks he'll get away with it, the girlfriend finds out. Let me guess. The girlfriend decides to leave him, they fight, and things get worse, proving that even in such an amazing place as Bora Bora, things can go wrong. Not exactly. I had hoped that would happen, but it turns out the girlfriend had a dark side. At first she goes along with it, but from what I've discerned, it doesn't end well for her either. Right? You always want a twist in the end of some kind. The girlfriend confronts him, 
they fight, and cliche or not, she throws him off the balcony of their hotel. Sounds a little like the story is a bit like a Greek tragedy. No one is the good guy. Victor said with air quotes, does she get caught? I don't think so. But the ending hasn't been written yet. It could all change. Right, Victor said. Mark walked to a small bar near his library of books, where he pulled out a bottle of bourbon, but stopped to look at a picture. It was of Mark's first wife, Lacey. If Mark was contemplative before, he was quickly traveling to the neighborhood of depression as he tenderly touched his late wife's face. His eyes watered, but that could have been more due to the alcohol. For some people, alcohol makes them more emotional. That must have been what was happening here. Victor shifted in his chair. Are you all right? You seem like you're going through something. Victor expected Mark to snap out of it and recognize that he was there. That showing his emotions like that was embarrassing, but he didn't. Mark wiped a tear from his eye. His face showed that the conversation was going to take a more serious turn. This was going to be a long night. It could be good because if Victor could connect with Mark on a personal level, perhaps Mark would feel more willing to help him with his writing. Maybe they could write something together. Lots of big-name authors were doing it. Victor watched as Mark carried Lacey's picture to his desk before saying, Tell me, do you believe in destiny? Victor waited for a breath before realizing Mark wanted him to respond. Destiny? I guess I haven't really thought about it. Take a moment. We all live our lives day in and day out, with little to no thought about if events are connected. Coincidence, luck, and randomness. Where do you think it all fits? Do you think there is anything to it? Victor did take a moment before speaking. I'd say no, I don't. He wasn't sure what Mark was getting at. Maybe this was something Mark did when he got drunk. He delved into the philosophical. Victor could do that. He could play that role. I'll tell you what catapulted me into the stratosphere of writing. I went from no name to a household name in a matter of, what, two years? And I can say it has nothing to do with me. I have a secret. It's something I have never told a soul. Victor was beginning to think he was getting set up for a joke. Mark raised his glass. It's about a book. A journal, in fact. At least I've come to think of it as a journal. I suppose it is so much more than that. Mark took a sip from his glass after removing his jacket and hanging it on a hook near the door that led out to the patio. His shirt was blue with buttons, no pockets. He unbuttoned the top two buttons and shifted his head as if he had removed a restraint. He let out a long sigh of relief. If I told you outright, you wouldn't believe me. In fact, I'm certain you will not believe me when I'm done. But maybe by telling you, I'll feel like I tried, like I gave it my best shot. Lord knows I've tried before, and I regret it. Victor almost rolled his eyes. The idea that Mark was going on about being this great mentor seemed far-fetched helping others and being some kind of upright standing man. From what Kim said, he never took anyone under his wings, never wrote to anyone, and never talked about his process. The man was far too gone, but Victor couldn't help but keep the conversation going. You never know when you will discover a diamond in the rough. Try me, Victor said. Mark nodded. It all started with Lacey. Mark gripped the picture frame tightly. I didn't understand what I was getting into. There was no way that I could have known. Mark placed the picture on the desk facing him as he sat, looking back at Victor. You see, she loved to go to old antique shops and garage sales. She'd buy the ugliest things and surprise me with them. Nine times out of ten it was pure junk, but she always saw something special in everything she encountered. Mark reached for his drink, paused, then put it back down without the customary swallow. He sighed with a contemplative grin on his face. I miss her. The gall of the man bringing up his first wife while his current wife was in the house feeling neglected. It's why Victor was able to find his way into her heart, so for that, he was grateful. God bless the vacant husbands of the world, Mark continued. That was until she came home with my anniversary present. It was a book of sorts, an old beat-up cover with no sheets in between. Mark shook his head. I hadn't written my first novel yet, so I was struggling, writing every day and getting nowhere. The journal had no sheets, just a well-used leather-bound cover but nothing inside. It sort of represented where I was in life, I suppose, and for a moment I thought she was trying to tell me something, but no, that wasn't who she was. She genuinely thought it was a great gift. She suggested that I had it bound to complete it. I thanked her like I did with everything she gave me, then promptly placed it on the bookshelf where it sat for several weeks. He pointed to the vague direction of a nearby bookshelf before continuing. The challenge of reaching new levels of writing often brings writer's block, and, like everyone on the planet, my life settled with the routine of looking at the blank page. Well, 
in my case, the blank screen. Each day, I would pull up the computer, sit by the window and stare thinking about what kind of story I could write. At that time, I had no clue and not a single creative thought. Mark glanced at the window where he apparently sat, staring out at the lake just as he had done in the tale he was telling. Victor wanted to say something but felt he needed to wait. Connecting with people often meant timing your words. Mark's eyes darted back and forth as he fidgeted in his seat. His fingers tapped nervously on the armrest, and Victor could hear Mark's foot bouncing up and down. He looked like a man possessed, haunted by the very thing he loved most, writing. As he spoke, Mark's voice grew low and menacing, his words tinged with a sense of desperation. The writer's block had taken hold of me, and I was losing my mind. I tried everything, but nothing worked. I was at the end of my rope, ready to do whatever it took to break free from this curse. Mark's eyes scanned the room, searching for something. Then they locked onto an empty space on the shelf, and a sly smile crept across his face. That's when I had the idea, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. I hadn't tried to write the way people had done in the past, with pen and paper. He held his hand as if holding an invisible pen and began tracing words in the air. So, I went out and bought some paper and took out the journal. But it wasn't as easy as I thought. I had to learn how to bind the paper to the cover, which took some time. But it was worth it. It was a nice respite from the stress of not writing. Mark's smile widened, but there was a glint in his eye that made Victor uneasy. I spent days researching the traditional bookbinding techniques, from the press to punching holes for the sewing. He paused and pointed to the corner of the room, where a strange device sat. It had a base with two metal legs holding a piece of wood about a foot high with five strings tightly bound to both the base and the wooden bar above. All the way to buying the glue for the back with the press. Mark waved a hand. But you don't want to hear about the intricate nature of traditional bookbinding, but needless to say, the process has evolved, and in the end, I found it therapeutic. However, it didn't help me with my block, but once the book was built, the papers were bound and the cover closed. The actual moment I opened that cover to try to write, he slammed his hand on the top of the desk, startling Victor. Would you believe that I did? He straightened in his seat with a smile like remembering a fond memory. He pointed at Victor. The moment I put pen to paper, an idea struck me. It was there. It struck me like a lightning bolt. So, the manual processing of writing worked for you, Victor asked. The tactile sensation triggered your imagination? Mark C. sawed his hand back and forth. I thought so, but it turns out it wasn't the fact I was writing. Mark gave a sly, lazy smile as he continued. That day, I discovered something inside of me that I had never seen. I wrote so feverishly that hours passed without me taking a break. I started the story, wrote all the way through, and only stopped to rest my hand on ice and massage it through the cramps. All the while, the idea haunted my mind. I couldn't control it, and it was consuming my every thought, that is, until I finally wrote through the climax and the resolution. When I looked up, I was shocked to see that it was 13 hours later. I had written more than 60,000 words in that time, and it felt like no time had passed. Mark massaged his hands as if he was feeling the pain of the experience all over again. Victor was skeptical. Could Mark be playing some elaborate ruse to trick him for some reason? He wasn't sure, but also didn't see the benefit of confronting how crazy this seemed. You wrote 60,000 words in one sitting, he asked. Mark nodded. His shoulders shrugged as if to say he didn't believe it either, but it was true. Now, I did like most authors do and set the story aside. I took a break, proud of what I had achieved. I told Lacey what I had done and, in a few weeks, I edited it, then let her read it. I was excited and couldn't wait to find an agent. In fact, I sent the first few pages to some agents to see if, Anyone would be willing to take it on. It wasn't until two months later that I rescinded the request. You did what? Mark nodded. I informed every agent that received the submission to throw the papers away. One agent even asked for the rest of the story. He felt there was something there. But why? Victor was interested. Why would anyone purposely not get published? At the time, I thought that maybe I had let my subconscious get the best of me. You see, you wouldn't know this. But about 20 miles east, a small town named Sycamore Hills had got some attention. The story even went nationwide for a few days. A delivery guy from some local pizza shop was casing homes to later break in and murder people. Somehow, my subconscious must have latched onto it because my story was about that event. 
I had even written about the team that ultimately caught the guy. It was strange at the time because, I swear, I hadn't even read about it until much later. I must have heard it over the radio or on TV, and my mind ran with it. The story I wrote was no more than a retelling of what happened to that poor family and the murderer. When I realized that, I felt I couldn't publish it. Some of the scenes were quite dark and twisted. The family would surely have read or heard about it, and I was certain the scenes I had written were likely not what really happened just the twisted muses of a moment of inspiration. In any case, I took the story and placed it into the vault. Victor tried to keep a straight face. Over the last couple of weeks, he'd look at Mark safe in his office and wonder what was in it. The mention of the vault piqued his attention. You put the story in the vault? Victor hoped the question was casual enough. Mark nodded. Wouldn't you know when I sat down to my computer to write after that moment? I wrote. Of the People, Book One of the Victory Series. Is that so? Victor decided to entertain the man. He was drunk and talking. He wanted to see where this was going. I didn't connect the dots about what was happening until a couple months after of The People was published. I found myself with writer's block yet again. This time, I went to the journal and, just as before, wrote straight through to the end. I'd written the darkness within. I read that. It was so fresh and interesting, but very different from Of the People. Right. That one earned me several awards and led to my writing by the people. It wasn't until several cycles later that I realized something. Each day when I began writing, I had a header at the top of the document. I write the date at the top right of the page. Then at the end of the day, I write the word count. About eight years ago, I'd written a rather dark story, maybe darker than before. It was about a stalker going after a yoga instructor and her journey to prove her danger. She ultimately took things into her own hands by hunting the stalker. Victor said, Right, I remember that event. They both ended up in prison. That was, he tried to remember. Nodding as he added, Yes, around eight years ago. I think the news broke mid that year. May? Mark pointed to Victor. Exactly. Except the day I wrote the story. It was April 18th. Mark stood and rushed to the vault. Opening it, he pulled out a stack of papers. He paused before handing them to Victor. The first sheet showed the scribbles of a story, and the date at the top right read April 18th. Word count 35,000 words. You didn't write 35,000 words in one day, did you? Victor asked, his voice revealing skepticism. Mark nodded. Look at the last few sheets. Victor shuffled to the back of the stack and found some bright white printer paper. It was the printout of a news article talking about the event. The article talked about how on May 15th, Joey Baker was sent to the hospital and Sylvia Hayes was taken in for questioning. I wrote it almost a month before it happened. A long, awkward pause consumed the room. The rain pelted the windows as Victor tried to grasp how to respond to what he was being told, to what Mark was showing him. Everything seemed so complicated, so meticulous, and Victor was on the brink of flat-out telling him he was a fool. It also seemed too elaborate to be a joke. Are you sure you didn't write the wrong date on the paper? It could have been 518 rather than 418. Mark viciously shook his head. No, no, I'm telling you, I wrote that event before it took place. Mark poked at the papers with excitement, the alcohol exaggerating his movements. Victor was unsure how to act, okay. He lifted his hands in surrender. You wrote it before the event. Mark returned to his desk and filled his glass with the last of the bourbon. Motioned Victor to see if he wanted a refill, but Victor waved the offer away. I'm good. Someone needed to keep a clear head. Maybe you should slow down. Or better yet, put the drink away. Mark ignored Victor's advice. He decided to go along, but soon would need to end the evening and let Mark sleep it off. The way he was almost erratic with his thoughts and emotions caused Victor to stay on guard. One thing was for certain, Victor didn't want to upset him. Well, this went on for a few years. I'd write a few of these stories, watch them come to pass in the news, and every now and then it would give me an idea that I could publish. Sort of a reward for what I did, you see. At least, that's what I think. The more stories I would write, the better the novels were that I was allowed to publish. Mark took a gulp, spilling some on his shirt. His shoulders dropped, and at that moment, he seemed a decade older. I was writing events that were playing out in front of my eyes, and it haunted me. I didn't know what to do about it. I can imagine, Victor said. No, you can't. Not really. I have had countless sleepless nights going through what it was doing to me, yet I never stopped. I couldn't. I suppose it was and is an addiction. I grew a sort of warped interest in wanting to know what tragic event someone was about to go through. I would write in the journal as often as my hands could last to see what would happen. 
Mark stopped, went to the safe, and pulled out an antique book. He placed it on the table between them and pointed. This is it. This is the journal. My muse. It was an old, tattered, leather-bound book, just as he'd described. No labels or words were on the cover. There were about a hundred sheets in it. Mark placed it on the desk, then handed a set of papers to Victor. Notice that these two stories were local within fifty miles from here. That didn't occur to me until Lacey and I were on vacation on the East Coast. There's no reason it would have. Mark scratched his head as if playing out the events one more time would make a difference. Victor noticed the dates. It was around the time of Lacey's death. He leaned forward. I remember hearing about what happened. It was after that event that I learned of you and your writing. It led to me reading your first book. I can't imagine what you went through. Mark finished another glass, filled it up again, then sat back at his desk, the journal between them. I had it with me, and Lacey went to the spa, so I decided to write. I opened the journal just as before. An idea sparked in my mind. I remember it as if it happened yesterday. It was about the murder of a couple. I was going through it when I realized the story was set in the same city we were in. In fact, I remembered passing the crime scene earlier that day. I finished the session and then began to wonder, what if I could save that couple? I must have read the story a dozen times, inspecting every single detail of what the murderer did and the events that were happening, and concluded roughly the time of day it was going to take place. In the story, the husband was murdered and the wife was taken. I thought that I might be able to save these people. Why wouldn't you have gone to the cops? And do what? Tell them that I know of a crime that hasn't happened yet, even if I gave them the couple's names, even if I walked them up to the murderer's house. They wouldn't do anything if a crime hadn't been committed. No, if these people were going to live, I'd have to do something. Mark took another gulp. His actions were drawn out sluggish. His eyes drooped. He was almost talking with his eyes completely closed. Mark lifted a weak finger and pointed it in Victor's general direction. It was late, almost midnight. They were going to be walking down a particular street, so each night I'd go for a walk. Lacey would be asleep, and each night I'd wait, watching for the couple. I even convinced Lacey to stay an extra week. We saw the sights and took in some shows. But when midnight came, I was there. Then one night it happened. I saw them. I saw the murderer sitting in a van, watching them. Do you know what I did? Victor did know. I remember reading how you attacked the guy. That's right. I was hiding next to the dumpster with a pipe. As soon as the guy pulled out the gun, I hit him in the head. I thought it would knock him right out, but it didn't. He ran away and I ran after him. I don't know why. Adrenaline, I guess. The story was incredible. Mark was beginning to tear up. How was I supposed to know that Lacey was up? It was after midnight and she'd never woken up before. She'd never followed me. How did she even know I was there? Victor shook his head but said nothing. What could he say? I paused when I saw her, and that pause was all it took. The guy turned and shot at me. I started to chase after him but stopped. Something told me to turn around. There she was. Tears began to stream down Mark's cheeks. The stray bullet hit her. Victor looked down. He knew the story. She died on the way to the hospital. He'd saved the couple but lost his wife. Mark turned and wiped his eyes as he attempted to gain some composure, this time only taking a sip. You see, the muse wanted a death. It needed it, and when I changed the story, it took my wife. I lost my wife because I tried to change the story. Mark sat up, attempting to appear sober. Victor paused, trying not to scoff at the words that were going to leave Mark's mouth. Part of him wanted to play into the delusions Mark was describing. Maybe it was the only way he could deal with a difficult situation. He made himself into a hero, but he couldn't let it go completely. You really feel you're writing the future in that journal? Victor pointed at the tattered book on the desk between them. Mark straightened his shirt and massaged his neck, trying his best to seem clear-headed. That brings me back to my question. Do you believe in destiny? In fate? In the idea that tomorrow isn't as random as some might believe? The rumbling of thunder rolling over the hills gave Victor an uneasy feeling. The rain wasn't coming down as hard. The storm was passing. Victor looked deep within himself for some philosophical retort, but couldn't find any. Either the man was insane, or maybe he was trying to get to him. Was there some kind of message here that Victor needed to understand? Was Mark trying to tell him without telling him that he knew about the affair in an almost incomprehensible way, or was he really saying that he writes the future? No, there is no destiny. I can't believe it. There is no plan for us. We are nothing more than chaos, and with all due respect, this feels like a bad joke. Victor finally said, Mark sipped again and lit a cigar. 
It was only after I returned from that trip and buried Lacey that I put the journal away. For a time, I felt I had to stop, but like any addict, I found it, dusted it off, and delved back into the darkness. But this time, I came up with the rule. Rules? Victor played dumb. He knew the rules well. Mark traveled alone. Kim was allowed to live her life, but any time Mark wrote he was elsewhere and would never write around her or local to where they lived. Mark never brought anything with him except the clothes on his back. No jewelry, no cell phone or laptop, just the journal. Kim talked about the bizarre ritual of how each time Mark returned, she prepared to take a load of clothes and items to goodwill. If she didn't, they'd pile up. Victor understood now the reason why. Mark was under the delusion that writing in the journal would give him insight into tragic events, and in some cases he felt it might mean the end of someone he cared about. He removed all familiar things so anything he wrote wouldn't cause him to be distracted. The truth was probably far saner. His subconscious mind could never move on after his wife's death and develop this bizarre narrative as a coping mechanism. For a moment, Victor felt sorry for him. Yes, I have found a system that works. I write on the road and only return when I'm taking a break from writing. Mark pulled on the cigar and breathed out a sizable cloud of smoke. I would stop for several months at a time, but each time I'd find myself traveling with the journal, and from time to time, I'd actually find someone in the story, sometimes like this one. Mark pulled another set of sheets out of the journal and placed it on the desk. This one, I found the victim. I found the guy that was getting poisoned but didn't try to save his life. Who was to say that by saving him, someone else dies? Victor looked at it and noticed it had an article paper clipped to the back talking about a man after his wife poisoned him. I've got several stories where I was able to find the victim, but each time I wanted to save them but wouldn't do it if it would come at the price of someone I cared about. It's like the muse weighs life and the balance must be maintained. It doesn't seem to care how, almost like the people killing them are more like tools for it than independent actors. Maybe I'm its tool. I'm the tool of the muse, he said as he tapped the journal. He left his hand on it, rubbing it softly as he closed his eyes for several seconds. Victor pointed at the journal. You've mentioned it a few times. I thought these events were planned and unchangeable. You know, destiny. Mark managed to open his eyes again, one after the other. At first, I thought it was a gift. I thought of it as my muse, but I was wrong. It's dark and dangerous, and I wish you were right. I wish that destiny didn't exist. That we could make our own way because the truth is far darker. The muse is always in control. Mark's face was deadly serious, and it was like he was trying to force Victor to understand that he was telling the truth. Victor couldn't see it, though. It was the drunken musings of a desperate man that even if he knew his wife was having an affair, he was too cowardly to face it. Mark was clearly upset as he stood, then began slowly pacing the room in thought. It looked as if he was turning over ideas in his mind. He walked back and forth a few times before sitting down, grabbing the journal and finishing yet another glass. His eyes dropped as he mumbled and rocked his body side to side. He shrugged his shoulders. I'm telling the truth. The muse gets you in the end. No matter what I do, I can't change it, and it'll always get you. Mark shifted in his chair and leaned back. He closed his eyes and slowly shook his head as he relaxed more. Moments later, he was asleep, one hand tightly gripping the journal. The other held the empty glass. The rhythm of his breathing told Victor that, for Mark, the evening had come to a conclusion. Victor stood and walked around the desk. The vault's door was ajar, so he pulled it open to find a pile of stories. It didn't make sense. Mark had to be lying. But why? What was he trying to achieve? Victor pulled a couple of the stories out and skimmed through them. It took him over half an hour, but they seemed to follow the overall trend. The stories were accompanied by articles with dates after he'd written them. Why would Mark go to such lengths to make so much up? Could he want to believe he's special so badly he plays this trick on unsuspected individuals? Victor didn't think so. Kim would have told him, unless she was in on it. But it was all so extravagant. Nothing was adding up. Victor was lost in thought when a thud caused him to jump back. Mark's glass rolled to his feet. He picked it up and placed it on the desk before eyeing the journal. Mark's hand was loose, no longer grasping the journal. Victor picked the book up and looked at it closely. It was older than he'd thought. The cover was dry and didn't feel like leather, but he couldn't place it. The edges were frayed, and when he opened it, the pages were filled with words. It was the story Mark hadn't finished writing, the one that he only had the climax left to finish. Didn't coming home before finishing the story break one of his so-called rules? Victor wondered for a moment what would happen if he took the book. He could take it and publish the story himself. He was good enough to finish the ending, if that's all that was left. 
If anything, take it long enough to copy it. If Mark ended up not publishing it, then maybe he could. It would end up being his word against Mark's. He could take that chance. He opened and flipped to the end to see how much work was needed. A detective was speaking with the female lead. He apparently knew that she'd killed her boyfriend, but couldn't prove it. She held her ground, and Victor found that he liked the way she thought. She was smart. What the hell are you doing? Kim shouted. Victor dropped the journal onto the desk and looked up. Wait, I was just looking at his hands raised in surrender. Vic, get out. I don't know what you're doing, but stop and go home now. Kim's voice was stern and vicious. Victor stepped away from the desk. Okay, I'm going. You will not believe what Mark told me. The man is crazy. You know that, right? Kim ignored Victor's words. She checked on Mark, found him soundly sleeping, and tugged on his shoulder. Honey, let's get you into bed, okay? Mark's eyes remained closed as he mumbled through his slurred speech. The muse gets you in the end. Nothing you can do about it. Victor shook his head. Insane. Shut up, Vic. Kim ordered. Victor paused behind Kim as she and Mark labored towards the bedroom. The journal was back on the desk. He could get it. Vic, go home. Kim's voice had the edge he'd known well, and he knew he was at the end of the line if he wanted to keep her in his life. He decided to take the high moral ground and leave. The night had been long, and Victor thought he might have taken things too far with Mark. Hopefully, Kim would understand that he was just trying to learn what he could while he had the time. To make up for the misstep, Victor decided to do some yard work around their house. That way, he would be in a position to hear conversations and see through the windows to better gauge how things work. Victor was trimming the hedges when he noticed the gate opening and the familiar black Mercedes from the driver's service approaching the house. He started working his way closer to the garage and paused when Mark stepped to greet the driver. He turned off the trimmer. Good morning, Mark, Victor said to the wave. Morning, Victor. You know you don't have to do that? We have a landscaping company that'll take care of the hedges. I know, but I wanted to do something for you. Something to show that I'm grateful for you letting me stay here. You know, I want to carry my own weight. Mark nodded as he walked the car. You're leaving so soon? Mark nodded again but didn't say anything. So Victor pushed forward. That's right, you've got to finish your novel, right? Mark got into the car and then rolled down the window. That's right. I have a clear vision of what's what, so I might finish it on the plane. Oh, Victor asked. He was curious to keep Mark talking. This abrupt leaving felt strange to him. Care to share how it's going to end, Victor asked. He wasn't sure if that was against the rules, so he was surprised when Mark thought about it for a moment and then began, The girlfriend gets away with it, but ends up committing suicide. In the end, she couldn't handle what she had done and couldn't face going back home to confront her husband. Victor didn't remember the girl being married. Was that another jab at the affair he was having with Kim? If Mark knew, then why didn't he confront them? Victor supposed that somewhere in Mark's subconscious, he couldn't face the truth. So the vacation to Bora Bora was anything but a romantic getaway. Mark shrugged his shoulders. Looks that way. With the ending planned out, I've already got a new idea coming to me. This one, I'm certain I'll be able to publish. A new one? Victor was caught feeling like an echo. Have you decided if you're going to publish the vacation from hell? Still not sure. I'll have to see how the next few weeks play out. Victor wasn't sure how the next few weeks would matter, but he moved on. Right, we are all slaves to the muse, Victor added. That we are, Mark said as he rolled up the window. Victor watched the car leave, the gate closed behind it, then waited for several minutes until he felt confident that Mark wouldn't turn around for any reason. He decided to check on Kim. Inside, he walked past the living room toward the bedroom when he heard her voice. I'm here in the kitchen, Kim shouted. She must have heard the door and assumed it was him. Being careful to gauge how she was feeling, he slowly walked up and hugged her from behind. She paused from washing the dishes and stood still. He lowered his chin on her shoulder and leaned into her head. It was a move he knew she always loved. I'm sorry for how I acted, he said. Her shoulders relaxed, and he knew he had her. She'd forgiven him. She turned and they kissed. I know. It's okay. She twisted and turned the faucet off, then faced him with a smile. I have a surprise for you, she said as she broke the embrace. She went to the island and reached for her purse. A surprise? Really? Victor said as he gave her his best reassuring smile. Victor loved her surprises and couldn't wait to see what she'd gotten him. They'd given each other several gifts over the last weeks, and each one was better than the one before. She walked over, her hand in her purse. Mark isn't going to be returning for several weeks, and I told him I was going on a trip alone. 
like you said. A first for everyone, and he bought it. A trip, huh? Victor said with a smile. Where are we heading? Out of Kim's purse, Victor could see two plane tickets. She handed them to Victor. She placed her hands over his and reached up for a long, passionate kiss. I can't wait to spend a whole week with you with no worries of anyone seeing us together. I've got two tickets to a romantic getaway. He looked down to see a pair of plane tickets. Destination, Bora Bora. Thank you for listening to The Muse. By Kurt Petrie. Please subscribe and like the video.